Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America Merrill Lynch and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, M&T Bank, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chelsea Lighting. Additional support is provided by Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, Capital One Bank, Cassidy Turley, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Flushing Bank, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Corman Communities, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin, Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, The Wickoff Group, Urban American, and Ackman Ziff Real Estate, Aerial Property Advisors, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Goldman Properties, Moynian Group, Must Development, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Rosewood Realty Group, Terra CRG, Triangle Equities. You know, you grow up in Brooklyn like myself, and you say, you want to be a physician. You want to be a businessman. But how many people say, I want to be a writer. I want to be a performer. I want to be, I want to be a playwright. But I have that kid today. I have Jake Ehrenreich. Thanks for being here. <laughs> it's my pleasure. So now. By the way, I wanted to be a baseball player. I know you would. You wanted <laughs> Mickey Mantle. Right now, you're on Broadway, you know, in a, in a show called A Jew Grows in Brooklyn, and also the book A Jew Grows in Brooklyn. And then in addition, we have Yiddish Unplug. Now, tell me about your parents. You were saying to me when we got together the other day that your, 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 your father's family was relatively comfortable in Poland before the war, right? Oh, very comfortable. Um, my parents' family and, and the extended family, um, part of it was aristocracy in Poland. And my father grew up on a, a large farm, so large that the name of the farm was a diminutive of the name of the town. He grew up in a place called Zakshuv, and the farm he grew up on was called Zakshuvek. Um, and he told stories, you know, uh, about traveling to Cheder, you know, school, uh, with a horse and buggy. I mean, it was they were they were very um, fortunate. And my great aunt, when I went back to Poland, the home that she lived in today is a museum. Mm. So now, well. you, your parents um, went to Siberia to the work camp, right? Yeah. So, we, which was fortunate, so they didn't go to the Holocaust. But the rest of the relatives, many of them, passed on during the Holocaust. Your parents were in the displaced citizens. Uh, displaced persons, persons camp after in, Russia. After Russia. And your sisters were born there, right? My, w my sister Wanda, my older sister, was born in Siberia in, in the labor camp. And my father tells a very interesting story. You know, she had a mastoid. And um, they found a Jewish doctor, believe it or not, who operated on her. And he told my parents, uh, and used no anesthetic. And he told my parents, she'll die unless you can figure out a way to travel 10 miles a day to where I could change her bandages every day. And each day, either my mother or my father would get out of the camp and take my sister to have the bandages changed. Now, the interesting thing is when they came over in 1949 uh, via Hyas, yeah. they lived in the, in the building which was the public theater. Amazing to me. They did. We, we had a relative sponsor them, and the Hayas brought them over as well. So they lived on Lafayette Street in what is now the public theater. 
and I think you know the story, many, many years later I starred in a show for Joseph Papp at the public and in my first meeting to meet with Joe, I read the plaque on the wall. I didn't know. And here was this plaque saying this building was used to house the remnants of Eastern European Jewry. It was f really like coming full circle. It was amazing to me. So your parents come over uh, via Hyas and some other relatives, and your father initially settles in Brownsville. Well, no, initially on the Lower East Side, right, on Broom Street. And then by the time I was born, um, they moved to Brownsville, yeah. Right, they, they were in Saratoga. Up, they moved uptown. Uptown to Saratoga <laughs> Avenue. And when you were born... Um, and I, I tell you an interesting thing, just based on like their life. They had a seven-room apartment, and we only used three rooms for the entire time we lived there. I had two sisters, myself and my parents. Of a seven-room apartment, half of it was closed off. We only lived in three rooms. And the other three rooms were... A Michigas. I, I don't know. They, they were, you know, it was too big. Now, your father um, went into the upholstery business, yeah. right? Yeah. And he had a partner also. Yes, another Holocaust survivor named Aaron Katz. And um, when they dissolved the business, it was a fascinating experience. It was the two of them, and this was after many, many, many years, 40 years of partnership. Two of them, the attorney and myself. And the attorney turned to me and he said, watch this because this doesn't exist anymore. These men have never had a signed contract between them. It was always a handshake. And now they had since bought the building that the, the business was in and all. There were hundreds of thousands of dollars just in, in security deposits. He said, they're going to figure it out just talking amongst each other. I'm here just to watch. And they'll shake and they'll figure it out. And that's a thing from the past. But that was interesting because maybe it, it, put, it put you into the entertainment field. Your father and Aaron, uh, when I was reading in the book, went into some real estate. They owned some apartments. Yes. And when you were growing up, you were trying to manage the apartments? Tell the well, story later, about that yeah, later yeah. on in life. I, I'll tell you an interesting story because I learned so much uh, morality and ethics from my father. You know, for me, Yiddishkeit is more than just speaking Yiddish. It's, it's part of a culture. It's an ethical part of a culture that I, I saw in my father. So what happened was they had this building and the, the, someone new bought, the, I'm sorry, they had a business and someone new bought the building of 10 stores. And they were raising the rent to a point where they couldn't stay anymore. Their only option was to buy the building. He was going to sell it if someone would buy it. So Aaron and my father went to all their suppliers and said, look, if you can help us, you know, we, we will not be able to pay you for X number of months and if you could lend us some money. And they all trusted them and they loaned them the money and they bought the building. And that was the best move they ever made because then real estate went crazy and, and they would have had nothing from their hard work of being upholsterers, but out of the, the revenues of the building, the real estate, they, they survived you know, later in life. Um, it was fascinating. But what, what was the question you asked me? The story was with you. You were supposed to collect rents for Yes, them. yes, yes. So later, my father decides, okay, he's got to, um, he's got to retire. And uh, he said, look, we're going to sell the building. What do you want to do? I said... I guess I'll learn about real estate. You know, we'll buy some stuff up near where, we, where, where I was living and my dad was living in Monroe, New York. And we did. We eventually bought a few buildings and I managed the buildings. And I, I, I tell you an inter another interesting story about that. So we had a tenant at one point and he had a small child and he couldn't pay the rent. And I would let him go and go and go and go. And my father said to me, he said, you know, I love you. You're a nice guy. You shouldn't be in business because this, you know, this is crazy. And I just, you know, I took it for what it was. After my father passed, I found letters from a property we had still on Rockaway Avenue. A church had rented the property. They couldn't pay the rent. My father let them go for years without paying the rent. And I found a stack of letters saying, God bless you. God bless your family. We pray for you, Mr. Aaron Reich, how kind you are to us. So he was full of it. Right. <laughs> So you moved from Brownsville to uh, East Flappish, right? Yes. And uh, in East Flappish, you, um, you went to public school. Yeah. Where were, we, where were we going to public school? I went to PS233, Meyer Levin Junior High School, and Samuel J. Tilden High School. But at Meyer Levin Junior High School is where you got into the, I mean, you know, you were growing up, you wanted to be Mickey Mantle, you were playing with the kids. Uh, but when you were going to Meyer Levin, uh, there was something called the two-year SP, the three-year SP, uh, which really got you into the drum business. Okay, tell the story. Boy, so it was, um, I had skipped the third grade, and now they were skipping me from the eighth grade. Um, so 
In seventh grade, I was really a disaster. I was a smart kid, but I was, I was wild. And I had done something, um, and as a punishment, they decided that they wouldn't put me in the ninth grade. They would put me in the eighth grade for a few weeks to see how it went. And if I behaved myself, they put me forward. That was the year of the big teacher strike. So by the time eighth grade started, they looked at me and they said, this is it. And one of the enrichments of this so-called three-year SP was you had to play instru an instrument. And I was now a year and something behind everyone else. And I had a, a very smart, lovely teacher named Steve, Steve Feldman. He had a band called Steve Fields Music. And he allowed one of the very advanced students to take me into the hallway, uh, ostensibly to bring me up to snuff with the rest of the class. Meanwhile, the kid was a, a guy named Michael Wilner, very kind to me, and he agreed to take me way past the class. And that's when I really learned to play an instrument. And you learned to play the drums. I learned to play the drums then. By the time I got back, back into class, I was so far ahead of the class that my teacher allowed me to start to learn another instrument. So I started to learn trumpet and, and trombone and horn and F and, and E flat horn. Now also, horn. so when were you uh, in, a, in a choir when you were growing up? Uh, so just when I, I guess when I started bar mitzvah lessons, so it was probably, I don't know, 12 or something like that, um, so someone heard me sing and they asked me to be in this choir. Harry Laskin was the, the choir leader. And it was, you know, all adults and the altos were kids, you know, boys whose voice hadn't changed yet. And that was my first professional job as a, as a, a, a singer. Now, during uh, high school, what were you doing? You were working part-time on the circuit? <laughs> I was, I was a screw-up. I mean, you know, I was a smart kid, but I, I tried to go to school as little as possible. As a matter of fact, I actually sued my high school, or just about. Um, because I barely attended school in my last year. And I'll never forget, the, the school sent home one of those cards that says, your child has been absent on. And instead of filling in a date, I guess my homeroom teacher wrote almost all year. And that was actually part of what I was able to use. So they, they were going to not allow me to graduate in January. And uh, I called the American Civil Liberties Union because I had gotten over 85 on my regents examinations and the law is you got to pass the kid. So one thing led to another. We made an agreement. I stayed until June. But in, in, in high school, I, I, was, I don't know what I was doing. Yeah. I was playing drums, certainly, a lot. Now, when you were growing up uh, and going to, you know, in the East Flappish, your parents, you know, were going to the bungalow colonies uh, and, and taking the, uh, the car past the Red Apple Rest and the other uh, <laughs> famous scenery, you know, of, uh, of the Catskills. Um, what were you doing? You worked in the Catskills. I did. I started, you know, there's a story I told to, to Freddie Roman on one of these cruises. My first gig in the Catskill Mountains as a musician, I was so young, half the summer I worked at a hotel as a drummer and half the summer I went to sleepaway camp. That's how young I was. But um, the Catskills were an incredibly important place in my life and also to my family's life. First of all, in retrospect, what I realized the two most important things were First of all, as a musician, you know, you really had to learn in the Catskills. Nothing was clean, the, the music was all messed up, and you had to do a different show every night. When I got to do my first Broadway show on drums in New York, which was a big show, Bob Fosse's Dancing, I looked at the music, I said, what's the trick? It was clean, you could read it, nobody had spilled coffee on it, you know. So that was extremely important, the training of the Catskills. Boy, they didn't have any luxury kugel? No, and luxury kugel on the music. Um, also, watching these comedians was a big deal. But the thing that I really learned in retrospect, you know, I had such a warm feeling for it. And I came to realize the reason for that was because it helped families like mine heal. You know, survivor families that went to the Catskills, we went with big groups of survivors. With the Greeners. With the Greeners. And I always wanted to be the American kid, but we hung out with the Greeners, right? And my name was Yankee, but in this group, you know, Yankee I was always embarrassed about, but my friend's name was Kiwi, so it was fine. And our parents sort of relaxed. They were with groups of each other. You know, the comedians would do Yiddish, the punchlines would be in Yiddish, they, and everybody sang a Yiddish song. It was really a healing. I, I, I saw my mother laugh more in the Catskills and my father than anywhere else. So you graduate Tilden, you're a musician, uh, and you decide to... Uh, 
Stony Brook. I mean, did you know what Long Island was? I mean, ah. You know, Brooklyn, you know, the, the Long Island was where the, the people migrated, you know, for the, for the other situation. <laughs> you know, the five towns were a section. Maybe you'd get to Manhasset. But to <laughs> Stony Brook, they, there were no people who would live in Stony Brook. I was you know? just, there were farmers. That's right. I was just trying to prove something to my Fakakta guidance counselor who, you know, when I went to talk to her, she said, well, maybe you want to go to vocational school. I said, Daisy. I'm a middle-class Jewish kid. I'm going to a good college. Look at my SAT scores. What are you talking about? I wanted to prove to her and to my parents that I could get into a good school. So what did you do the first year at uh, Stony Brook? Oh, everything. You know, I, I remember watching the movie Animal House and saying, yeah, and we were really crazy, really crazy. So that was a year. And, yes. and then the second year, what happened in the second year? I got offered to go on the road as a musician. And I convinced my teachers, God bless them, I convinced them I would go on the road and do my work on the road. It would be like a work-study program. Meanwhile, as soon as I got on the road, all I was doing was, you know, chasing after girls and, and, and anything else that I felt like doing. And I did no work at all. So by the time I got back to school, it was like they looked at me and they said, you didn't do anything. Now, you know, I did a show a couple of years ago with my friend Drew Napore and uh, the restaurateur, and he was saying... Uh, one summer, he worked on the cruises. Mm. Now, he worked on the cruises, as he said, when he was serving Russian service, uh, everything, and he gained 39 pounds in a seven-week period, because ah. every time he was going up, he ate something, everything time he went out. Now, what were you doing on the cruises? Oh, my. I, so I started when I was just a kid. I was playing drums, and it was really wonderful, because I did two world cruises on the old SS Rotterdam. They were three months long. I was, you know, 19 years old. And it was the best time of my life. I mean, I went all over the world. I had the greatest experiences you could possibly imagine. It was also a very important time because, on a serious note, that was the time I finally wrote a letter to my father. My father never spoke about his family at all, as opposed to my mother. And I wrote a letter to my dad. I finally got up enough courage, and I said, why don't you ever talk about your family? He wrote back a very beautiful letter in which he, in which he said he was afraid that his words would pale in comparison to who and what was lost. Now, what that. was interesting, which I, I really had to bring up, was when you worked at that casa, that, that Italian restaurant, Casa, with oh, the cheesecake. Oh, La Croce Vita. La, La Croce Vita. I think it's important to tell the story because it relates to just about ah, your dad. That is a great story. So uh, there was a guy, Joe, who ran it. I was a kid. I must have been 12. I, I, you know, you had to be 16 to have working papers. Somehow this guy gave me a job in the kitchen. And I would do the baked clams, and I would do the antipasto. One of my jobs was to go down in a basement and bring stuff up. I was bringing up a cheesecake, and I dropped it. And I decided to throw it away and bring up another one and not mention anything. The next day I came to work, and Joe came over to me and said, you know, did you do this? And I started to cry. And he said, OK, um, had you told me, I would not be charging you for this. But since you hit it, I'm going to take this out of your salary until you paid for the cake. And he took a little bit every week. He was, he was actually teaching me a lesson. And he tried to explain to me, you have to take responsibility for your actions. So about a, somehow I ended up telling my father about this. I don't know how that happened, but I did. A week or two later, I see in the restaurant my mother, my sisters, and my father. My father worked 15, day, 15 years, seven days a week till 10 o'clock at night. So, and he certainly never went out to eat. First of all, he was against it. And second of all, he had an ulcer. He certainly wouldn't eat at, a, at an Italian restaurant. I see him out there, and I'm like, what is going on? And then near the end of the night, I'm sure he didn't eat anything, I see him and this fellow Joe talking in the corner, and then they just shook hands. And I know my father took the time to, took time off work, which was a big deal, to go and thank this man for the lesson that he taught me. Another immigrant from, from Italy this time, just like my father. Never forget how valuable that was. Let's talk about, um, you know, you talk about your dad. You did something, your mother was, uh, both your mother and your two sisters had early Alzheimer's, but you did something, the golden lamb. Let's talk about that. So my mother was in a nursing home um, run by the Workman's Circle, because my mother had early Alzheimer's disease, as did both of my sisters. And they were having some sort of a party, and um, I went, and they had a piano player, and I thought that people would like if I sang a Yiddish song in honor of my mother. And I asked the piano player, you know, in a Yiddish song, <laughs> he laughed at me, he said, what do you know? You know, I had hair down to here. 
So I ended up singing a few songs, and then he came over to me and asked, would I like to be in a show that they were producing called The Golden Land? Um, and I, you know, I kind of laughed. I took his card. It was the last thing that I wanted to do. And I went and told my father about this, and my father pulled the whole guilt thing. He said, you know, you need to do this in honor of your mother, and you know. I ended up going and auditioning. I had a broken leg when I auditioned because from playing baseball, I actually broke my leg. And I got this job. Um, and since I had a broken leg, I was, I was the standby for Bruce Adler and Avi Hoffman. And it, it, I met this whole new group of people, young people who spoke Yiddish. And it was a whole new world to me. Um, it was a very valuable experience. Now, you know, before, and we'll get to the to the book, the play, and everything else. But before that, you, you know, you were, you, you even wanted to change your name, like half of the- I did. The, you tra uh, that's right, you changed your I name. I did. Right. Somebody just, a, a, a relative of mine just sent me a picture, an old headshot, Jack Rennick, J-A-C-R-E-N-I-K. So it lasted about two weeks. So you changed your name, but also you auditioned for The Who, right? Didn't you? Uh... Oh, I, no, I auditioned for Kiss. Kiss, right. Um, and you could have been there because Gene Simmons was Jewish, you know? And, his at, and a child of survivors, and so was Paul Stanley. So you auditioned when for Peter Kiss. Chris, oh, yeah, I spent you know, hours and hours with them in a little room. I came very close. I, I, and in those days, I was doing a lot of that kind of stuff. I actually also played with Edgar Winter for, for an audition. And coincidentally, when this show was in L.A. this last year, I had a tooth problem. And I, I was recommended to a dentist. And as I walk in, Edgar is sitting in the, in the, in the lo lobby. So we're sitting together, and I thought, all right, I'm not going to. You know how many years this is? And finally, I just said, Edgar, by the way, I auditioned for you in New York in 1980-something. He says, oh, I remember that tour. Yeah, you know, we never did that tour. I hired Kenwood Denard, and we actually never did it. And we just ended up talking. And what about the other tour with it? Ringo? Yeah, well, I, I was in Beatlemania. I played Ringo in Beatlemania, which was really, really great. I had such a ball. When we went, we went to New Zealand, and the only, you know, the Beatles, one of the original tours were in New Zealand. So when we were there, we were as close as these young kids could ever get to the Beatles. And we were on the front page of every newspaper when we went into town. It would be the Beatles picture. Then we would go to the same hotel or whatever and take the same photograph. And needless to say, for a young man, it was, it was you know, a nice time. Uh, Jesus Christ Superstar? No, no. I, I didn't do Jesus Christ Superstar, but I could. I had long hair. Didn't and you I play was a Jonah Jewish or something? Kid. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I starred in a show for Joseph Papp, that show I was talking about, um, which was called Jonah, That's which right. really coincidentally is my father's name. So imagine that whole story That's about That's why I knew the, the Jonah, but I wasn't sure. Oh, yeah. That. that was a great experience um, because it, it seemed so otherworldly to me that now I was. Now, you in were that an place. MC at the Fame Rainbow Room. At the Room. Rainbow Room. Okay, probably when my friend Tony May owned it. I think okay, so. Okay, because yeah. he brought the cabaret music back to the Rainbow Room. But then, you know, you were saying to me, you know, maybe when you met Lisa, uh, you know, and uh, fortunately met Lisa once, she got rid of you, then, then you got married <laughs> later on, right. and uh, as it's written in the book. But what's interesting is that um, you got involved with, uh, you were involved with a lot of orchestras. I mean, you worked for a number of orchestras, plus this Jewish orchestra. Yeah, yeah, I got very into Jewish music, and I got into, you know, when I was a kid, I, even my, my um, junior high school teacher, he had like a wedding bar mitzvah band, and I started to play drums in that when I was just uh, nothing. You know, he would pick me up at my parents' house. So I knew this really well, this whole club date world, they call it of weddings and bar mitzvahs in New York. And whenever I wasn't doing something else, I would make a couple of calls and get some gigs, you know, to, to go and play drums. And years later, I got into it as a band leader, and I fell in love with really good Jewish music. Not just Yiddish music, but a lot of Shlomo Karlbach music and Israeli music. And we had a band that did really first-class American music and first-class Jewish music. And I will tell you, a so, so it was like the chi Chinese from column A and column B. It, right, right. And, and I would see people look at us. It's like, how are they doing that? But we really love doing this kind of music and, and being able to play a lot of different styles so, well. So let's get to the thing. Here's a guy who, who didn't finish college, who was a How do you decide to write a play? And you know, that's, you know, they originally opened yeah. in uh, 1990, in 2006. 2006, yeah. Right. You know, it was interesting. 
I was successful at this business that I had, and I was also doing large national conventions for American Express and Hadassah and all these places, and I had a really good life, but I didn't feel like I was really making a difference. Even though I enjoyed having people dance for their wedding and all that, it was, it's a nice thing, it's an honest business. I wanted to make a difference and I really thought that if I could tell the story of my family in an uplifting way, as my wife often said to me, she said, you know, the, the biggest thing you could offer to people is how you've learned to live in joy given the circumstances of, of your family. And I thought if I could use the talents that, that God gave me, that I, that I have, and uh, that were given to me, you know, in a positive way and tell a, an honest story and make people laugh and use music, then I would do that. And I started to write this show on the road. I would walk every day six miles to my dad's house and then back. And I would think of things. And, and, and originally the show was eight hours long and I just kept cutting away at it. And I've been working on it ever since. So it initially opened up in 2006. Yeah. And um, it was 90 minutes then? No. Then it had an intermission. It was probably two and a half hours long. Okay. And now, okay. And then it's been on the circuit. It's been around yeah. the country, all over places. Then in 2010, you decided to write the book. I actually didn't decide. A woman came up to me at the end of a show and said, would you like to write a book? And I said, who are you? And they said, well, we are the original publishers of the Chicken Soup for the Soul uh, series of books. We like your take on what's happened and, and your positive attitude towards life. This is what we do. And would you like to do this? And I said, yeah, you know, it's great. And, and uh, that was a real labor of love. Let's talk about the, the, yeah. the uh, CD. The CD. It? And the, the book, by the way, has now led to a documentary that's going to uh, be a PBS thing. But the, um, the, the CD, my father, I promised him before he passed, not just before he passed, but sometime before he passed, that I would do a CD of Yiddish art and folk songs, which he loved very much. And once he passed, I um, found out his favorite songs, and we, I recorded it just myself and a wonderful guitar player named C. Landsbaum, who was Shlomo Karbach's musical director, by the way, and who's also a child of survivors. And we did it unplugged, just acoustic, me and him. I'm very proud of it. Two things, okay. The show is back on Broadway now. Yeah. Where is it being played? It's at the Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Theater at, uh, f on West 46th Street between 6th and 7th Avenue. And more important than even the show, the book, as your parents, is Lisa and Dovey. Tell oh. me, we, with one minute left. So I was so lucky to find love in my life. And then out of our love came this child who is now 14 years old and who made everything worthwhile. You know, the relationship between my father and my son was something that was from another planet, you know, was the most gratifying thing um, that, in my life, certainly the most important thing that's happened to Lisa and myself. And I, there's nothing that will, uh, will touch that ever, I'm certain. Although, when he has children, I, I guess we'll talk about grandchildren at that point. <laughs> that may be it. So is he in the show too? He's, well, you know, there's video and, uh, uh, and, and photographs, and he's all over the show. And of course, when he's around at the end of the show, if he's around, he comes out on stage, and people really, at that point, really. So use it. I would say, you know, uh, for the kid from Saratoga Avenue, <laughs> uh, okay, to East Flappish, the Tilden graduate, uh, who became a playwright, a performer, a drummer, a musician, a singer. Uh, I'm happy you're here today. Thank you. And Mike. hope to see you again. It's my great pleasure. Thank you so much. My pleasure.